Hello and welcome back to All About Russia. My name's Andrew and today we're going to be looking at one of the most famous people from the Caucasus, the Adygia. As this topic is quite frankly incredibly complex, I've teamed up with Vitaly from Ethnographia who's here to help explain and work with me on this video. Throughout this video, I'll be using the words Adygia and Circassian interchangeably. Why? Because they're basically the same thing. Uh, the name these people call themselves is uh, Adige. Uh, it's a national name, own name of people. And the Circassians, the second name of these people, are external name, which are used uh, mainly by uh, other nations, which are neighboring to Adige people. Name Adige has two potential origins. Uh, first one tells that A and Dige are two parts which mean peoples of the thumb. The A is an ancient uh, prefix indicating belonging, uh, which is still seen in the, for example, Abkhazian language, uh, which are more conservative, with some worshipping an ancient form of religion of the North West Caucasus. The second version of uh, Adige name origin means uh, seashore people or coastal people. This comes from the fact that Circassians lived most of their history between uh, Laba River on the east and the uh, seashore of Black Sea and other seas from the west. So, where does the word Cherkes or Cherkes comes from? In Russian, uh, the Circassians are known are as a uh, Cherkes. This name comes from the old Turkic language introduced uh, to the Russians by Turkic elements uh, of the Mongol forts and means literally the man who cuts the road. This title was used for many nations of the Caucasus region and was used in particularly by the Ottoman Empire, Ottoman Turks, as they advanced on the region, who called them Cherkessi. However, in Turkish, Cherkessi was spelled with a Ch, which if you don't know Turkish, looks an awfully lot like a C. So, when the British started to talk about the Cherkessi and see it right down, Cherkese become Circese and in English become Circese. Thank you for clearing that up, Vitaly. But hang on, did you say 12 tribes? Yes. Historically, the Circassian people, the Adigian, uh, were split into 12 uh, different tribes indicated today on the official uh, Circassian green flag as uh, stars. Uh, through devastating wars and invasions, some tribes were forced from their mountain homes whilst others were destroyed completely. And today, of the 12 Circassian tribes, only 5 still officially reside in Russia. Today, others are represented only by dozens of families. And most of them are represented uh, outside Russia, in the world, mostly in Turkey. Thank you again, Vitaly. Whilst all of these groups are Adigya, we will be looking in this video at the modern or West Adigya. The West Adigya can primarily be found in the Republic of Adigya. However, they can also be found in Krasnodar Krai, Moscow and the Moscow Blast, in the kabardino balkaria Republic, in the karachayevo Cherkessia Republic, and in the Rostov Blast. Outside of Russia, considerable communities exist in Turkey, Syria, Jordan, Israel, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Germany, Australia and the United States. The Adigya have their own language called Adigean. It is in the Circassian branch of the Northwest Caucasian languages family tree and it is largely intelligible with the other language in the Circassian language family tree, Kabardian. This is so much so that some people consider Adigian and Kabardian to be dialects of the same language. These people consider Adygian to simply be West Circassian. What makes matters more complicated is the fact that West Circassian or the Adygian language can be broken down into six dialects, those falling into two separate camps, those of the Black Sea coast and those of the Kaban River. 
The main dialect used in reading and writing is a Termagori dialect, but it is by no means the only one used. Indeed, some dialects of Adagaean still exist and are spoken but only exclusively outside of the historic Circassian regions, such as the Atsak dialect spoken among Circassian communities in Syria and Israel. However, there is little chance of the Circassian languages dying out, as communities both within the Circassian republics and abroad fund schools to teach their children how to read, write and speak Circassian. For those of you who are interested, West Circassian or Digian sounds a little like this. The flag of the Adigya is the same as that of the Republic of Adigea, a green background of 12 stars representing the 12 Circassian tribes, and three crossed arrows representing peace, although some claim it represents the three aristocratic Adigean tribes. The flag was designed by David Urquhart in 1830, who, if you watched our Republic of Adigya episode, will remember was a Scotsman, not a Circassian. The reason he created this flag was to drum up support abroad for the Circassians in Circassia, who were at that time fighting the invading Russians. As was the reasoning of the time, a proper civilised people needed a proper civilised flag. And once this flag was established, more funds and donations came in from French, British and Turkish sources. David Urquhart eventually got in a lot of trouble over creating this flag for the Circassian cause and was eventually recalled back to London from his diplomatic post in Istanbul. Interestingly, there was a story that he did not make this flag alone and was actually largely helped by a Circassian called Zephyr Bezanoko, who was living in Istanbul at the time. Our first mention of the Adigya comes from the 6th century BC, from Greek sources on the Black Sea coast, who refer to them as Maots. However, archaeological evidence suggests that Circassians have been living in the Northern Caucasus since at least 3000 BC, as evidence from the Maykop culture. The evidence suggests that they lived in tribal communities and often were in conflict with neighbouring tribes. What is interesting about these early Circassian tribes is that some were highly democratic, but others had an aristocratic, almost feudal base. The reason for this split is not quite clear, and it may have something to do with contact from the Greek city-states on the coast, or it may be inherent to highland societies, as many of the Circassians at the time lived in the highlands of the Northern Caucasus. As before stated in the Abkhazian video, Christianity began to spread among the people of the Northern Caucasus during the 1st and 3rd century AD. This was largely due to the Roman Empire using the Black Sea coast as a place of exile for Christians. However, many Circassians adhered to their ancient religion and would do so for many more centuries to come. The beginning of the 4th century AD saw a time of pressure put upon the Circassian peoples as waves of invaders began to arrive. Invaders from the north and from the east swept down into the Caucasus, beginning with the Bulgars in the 4th century and ending with the Khazars in the 7th. This pressure from outside forces forced some Circassian tribes to submit, whilst others fled further west into the mountains. Archaeology from the time suggests famine may have been another cause for this migration westward. In the late 7th century, as vassals of the Khazars, Circassians paid tribute, however were left largely autonomous in their own communities. These Adigian peoples played a role in deterring the Arab invaders in the same century. However, with the collapse of the Khazar Khanate in the 10th century, the numerous and divided Circassian tribes fell under the influence of various peoples, swaying between Georgian, Alan, Byzantine and even Genoese influence. In fact, this last group, the Genoese, are credited with making the Circassians infamous worldwide as slaves. The men for fighting soldiers in the army and the women for the harems of the Middle East. Despite this, however, slavery among the Circassian peoples was in relatively low numbers. The Circassian people came into contact with the Mongols in 1280 AD, after the Mongols had overrun the Georgian Kingdom. Indeed, from this pressure for Mongol forces, there was actually a flight further west again. As before, the Circassians paid tribute to their overlords, but were largely left alone. This allegiance to the Mongols followed with them up until the collapse of the Mongol Empire, at which point the Circassian tribes then paid fealty to the Golden Horde to the north. This is most notably seen in 1395, 
when Tamerlane invaded the Circassian lands, burning and pillaging the land and punishing the Circassians for their support of the Khan of the Golden Horde, Toktamish. After this punishing raid, the Circassian people began to split and form sub-ethos groups, most notably the Kabardians. We will of course explain this more in a future episode. As the power of the Golden Horde waned, the Circassian tribes began to assert themselves more and more independently in regards to political and economic matters. However, they remained a divided people, split by religion, geography and by blood feuds, being preyed upon by their neighbours in terrible slaving raids. Whilst the Genoese may have popularised the idea of the Circassian slave, it was the Khans of Primea who developed the slave trade to a horrifying level. Regular, devastating raids into the Circassian lands, where whole villages were abducted for the slave markets of the Middle East, caused a huge rift and massive resentment against the Crimean Tartars. Naturally, in the face of these devastating raids, the Adigia began looking for new allies. In 1552, Adigia soldiers were present at the Fall of Kazan as part of a diplomatic exchange to build an alliance with the growing power of Muscovy, later to be the Sardom of Russia. The Grand Duchy suffered similarly from the Crimean Tartar raids and thus they made natural bedfellows. It is interesting to note that whilst Islam had been present in the Caucasus since the time of the Arab conquest in the 7th century, it had never made huge inroads with the Circassian people, and they remained in the 16th century at least a Christian sea surrounded by hostile Muslim forces. The Turkish Ottomans had taken over the Khanate of Crimea at the end of the 15th century, and in 1570 began a wave of missionaries to try and convert Circassians to the Islamic faith. Thus, the first inroads of Islam began among the Circassian people. But it's interesting to note that at least in the 16th century, there were three prominent religions among the Circassians, Christianity, Islam, and their millennia-old native faith. The religious denominations of the Circassians at this time varied from tribe to tribe and were often influenced by the ruling elite. The end of the 16th century saw not only a huge religious change among the Adigia, but also a change in the manner of warfare. Firearms, captured from Ottoman, Crimea or even Persian forces, were used by great effect by the mountain-dwelling Adigia. Perhaps the most powerful effect of this was seen in 1708, when a 20,000 strong Crimean army under Khan Gaplan Garay moved into the Circassian lands to punish the Circassians for not sending tribute. This army was completely annihilated with the use of firearms by the mountain-dwelling Circassian people. This brought the tragedy that was the Circassian slave trade to a grinding halt. Firearms, however, were still used to settle internal disputes and blood feuds between one tribe and another. There is no official date for when the fighting started, but it is believed that Russian forces, hundreds of miles away from good supply lines as well as Cossack villages, forced to settle the new land started attacking the Circassian villages, raiding them for necessary supplies. This in turn resulted in a tit-for-tat raiding from the Circassians to the Cossacks, Cossacks to the Circassians, which spiralled and spiralled into a long and bloody guerrilla war. Raids of Circassian villages returned by raids on Stanitsas, punitive burning of Circassian villages returned by constant attacks day and night on moving columns of Russian troops throughout the mountains. Throughout the 18th and 19th century, Russian forces were moving to control the entire Caucasus, from Azerbaijan in the east to Circassia in the west. As the Orthodox Russians moved into Adigia villages with increasing brutality, there were calls for unity among the Circassians and amongst the Muslims for a holy war, Jihad. This was problematic, as while some tribes of the Abseks agreed with Shamal's message for a Caucasian Jihad, other tribes would not even let his envoys into the villages to speak. Despite most Circassians having converted to Islam in the 19th century, many rejected the call of arms for a jihad by Imam Shamil against the Russian forces. Instead, they operated independently, separately, providing sporadic defence and opposition to the encroaching Russian forces. Circassian unity remained a distant thing, and despite there being attempts to unite the Circassians, most notably by the Ubiks, nothing was achieved. The separate Circassian tribes sent envoys to try and woo the great powers at the time, some speaking to Great Britain, others to France, or some tribes appealing to the Ottomans. Naturally, each tribe got a different and thus mixed response. 
All three powers at various times implored the Circassians to fight. The British are going so far as to raise money and supply a national flag to try and unify the Circassians into an anti-Russian force. However, as the great powers' interests with Russia became more agreeable, their support for the Circassians waned and they were ultimately left to their fate. One by one, the people of the Caucasus fell before the Russian army. In 1857, Dmitry Milyutin, a field marshal in the Tsarist armies, devised a plan for the Circassians. Each Circassian tribe was given three options. They could surrender, they would be disarmed, moved with their families north of the Kuban River, and settled amongst loyal Cossack and Russian military forces or they could choose to emigrate to the Ottoman Empire to leave their ancestral homes. If neither of those choices appealed to them, the third was left to face utter destruction. As each tribe was separate, they each chose a separate fate. Of the five Circassian peoples that can be found in the Russian Federation today, the vast majority are the descendants of those Circassian tribes who opted for peace. These tribes, whilst they survived, were not treated well and one, the Shapsuks, were not allowed to even return to their ancestral land until 1880. Interestingly, the geography of the modern Adygia is actually the direct outcome of the Circassian Wars. For example, all of the Circassian republics exist inland, away from the sea, and are surrounded by either Russian or other ethnic groups from the Caucasus. The mass movement of Circassians north of the Kuban River had an interesting effect as well. Traditionally, the Circassian tribes had been independent of each other, some living in the lowlands and others in the highlands. However, those who accepted peace were all moved north of the Kuban River, leading to a lot of mixing and blending of the tribes. The modern Adigia today are the result of both highland tribes as well as lowland tribes who were forced to live together. Naturally, you might be asking, but why? with the musket-armed Circassians living high in the mountains ever surrender? There are two overarching reasons. The first is that the level of brutality was so much so that the only way for these peoples to survive were to accept defeat and be moved north of the Kaban River. The level of brutality involved in the attack on the Circassians had not been seen since the time of the Mongols. The second reason is that, as we mentioned earlier, not all of the tribes were democratic. Several of the aristocratic tribes who wanted to maintain their own power structure were content to be moved north of the Kuban, as the Russians were not interested in changing the dynamic makeup of the tribes. While some tribes did accept peace and move north of the Kuban River, many more refused. The Ottoman Empire invited the Cassians to Islamify parts of their empire which were dominated by Christian populations. However, despite the warm welcomes and invitations from the Ottoman Caliph, the ships that took them there were coffin ships, with men dying en route. Those who survived found the villages they were meant to move to completely unprepared, or worse, occupied. Once in the empire, the Ottoman support was limited. It quickly became clear that the Ottomans saw the Circassians as a means to an end, simply placing them in areas where they were worried about Christian rebellions taking place. Despite this, over the years, several prominent politicians and leaders have risen from the Adyghe communities of the Ottoman Empire. The Circassian community have played key roles in the development of Egypt, Jordan, and naturally, Turkey. Those tribes that did not flee or surrender were exterminated. The numbers of some tribes were brought so low, they ceased to be their own entity and were absorbed by larger tribes or simply wiped out to a man. Among the Circassian communities of the world, this time period is seen as the genocide of their people. And despite international pressure, it has only been acknowledged by one country, Georgia. The Circassian republics of the Russian Federation have petitioned not only the Duma, but also the European Union to recognize the events of this time as a genocide, something which they have refused to do. Following the end of hostilities in the Caucasus by 1864, hundreds of thousands of Adyghe were either dead, displaced, or rendered placid by Tsarist authorities. From this point onward, a policy of Russification was taken towards the Adyghe. However, due to the distance from Moscow to the Circassia, as well as the disarming of the population, this was not undertaken as viciously as it was with other minorities. 
As such, by the turn of the century, while some Adyghe did in fact speak Russian, many still spoke their native language. And whilst officially banned, they did in secret teach it to future generations. With the start of the First World War, most Adyghe were actually quite apathetic towards the struggle, whilst those in positions of leadership were quick to show their support for the Tsarist armies. The Cassians were not conscripted into the army, possibly seen as a potential liability in the face of Ottoman troops. However, the remnant of the Circassian nobility, who were now largely officers in the Tsarist armies, did play a large role and helped form the Wild Division, a group of Caucasian ethnic groups who served under the Tsar. In fact, this group would later go on to serve under white forces after the Bolshevik Revolution. With the coming of the Bolsheviks in 1917 and the disintegration of the Tsarist Empire, a divide appeared among the Circassian peoples. The Adyghe were split between supporting the Mountain Republic of the North Caucasus, a Muslim-led coalition of Caucasian peoples, or white forces based north of the Kaban River. Fighting flared up between the two sides almost immediately, and many Circassians lost their lives. Eventually, Soviet forces to the north beat both the white forces as well as the Mountain Republic, and incorporated the Circassians into the Soviet Union. Yet this was not necessarily a bad thing as was the Bolshevik policy for national minorities from the Tsarist Empire, the Circassians were actually given their own republic, with the space to practice their own land and culture in coexistence with communist philosophies, of course. This investment and inclusion of the Circassian peoples into the wider Soviet Union had several benefits for the Circassians. Levels of education and life expectancy also rose as Circassians were included into the wider Soviet Union, allowed to enter new fields and new industries across the breadth of their empire. However, this arrangement was not entirely all sunshine and roses. In reality, collectivization and propaganda led to the suppression of the Circassian or Adyghe identity in lieu of a new one, the Soviet citizen. The replacement of their national identity with a new Soviet one worked remarkably well. So much so that the Circassians were not seen as a danger when Joseph Stalin came to power. In comparison to other groups such as the Chechens, Stalin allowed the Circassians to stay in their native land, seeing them as dependable and loyal Soviet subjects. During the Second World War, huge numbers of Circassians joined the Red Army and helped work in the factories and fields to support the war effort. The fact Nazi troops landed in Circassia at this time made the struggle personal for many people if it had not been so already. After the war, the Adyghe remained an integral people of the Soviet Union right up until the 1980s. With the general thaw that followed the introduction of Glasnost during the late 1980s, a new revived interest in the idea of a Circassian or Adyghe identity emerged. This interest developed into an understanding of Circassian history, culture and even a revival of their millennia-old ancient faith. Yet, despite this rediscovery of their separate past, many Adyghe felt part of the Soviet Union and stayed within the Russian Federation after its fall. Today, the Adyghe can be found across the Russian Federation, with large populations abroad as well. With the rise of the internet and the modern internet connectedness of globalization, there have been demands by Circassians living abroad to return to their ancient native land. A demand that several countries, such as Russia, Jordan and Turkey, are reluctant to agree to. In fact, the legacy of russian Circassian relations has been a cause of discontent, as well as controversy. During the 2014 Winter Olympics held at Sochi, several Adyghans protested that the game should not take place in that city. Sochi had historically been the capital of a fleeting Circassian Union in the last days of the Caucasian War and was actually the site of one of the very last battles between the Russians and Circassians. When compounded with the fact that no Soviet or Russian government had acknowledged the genocide that took place, many Adyghans felt it was inappropriate to hold the Winter Olympics on a grave site of their ancestors. As before mentioned, the Adyghe are largely Muslim with a significant Christian minority. Yet, in addition to these two religions, they also have their native faith, called Kabze, which roughly translates to the language of the universe. This religion is millennia old, and the core tenets are to follow a good life so that your soul, your psa in Circassian, can be sent up to your ancestors and they will look proudly on your actions. Your ancestors will share in either elation or remorse at your life choices. Thus, 
those who follow Kabze strive to lead a fantastic and noble life, not for themselves, but for their ancestors as well. The origins of this religion seem to have root in the national epic of the Circassian people, the Nart Saga. As before stated, the societal structure of each Adygean tribe varies from one to another. Some tribes were aristocratic, other tribes were democratic. However, each of these groups had blood feuds and a raiding lifestyle in common, something seen among many of the people of the Caucasus. Uh, that's still a thing, isn't it, Vitaly? No. More than Adygean or Circassians. Uh, life perfectly normal. Lives. We don't keep blood feuds, and the only thing we might raid would be food from the fridge. Uh, speaking of food, Circassian food is rich and uh, reflects um, the changing seasons of the mountains, if he speaks about mountain Circassians. And mutton and soft cream based dishes in the autumn winter, and vegetable and dairy products in the spring or summer. Indeed, Circassian cheese is rated among the best of all the North Caucasus for its mild texture. Circassians eat cheese boldly or in pie. Their many dishes, including beef in sauce, cream sauce, it's uh, you know, mostly Cabardins do such kind of dishes. Cabardins who live on the plains of the central North Caucasus. Uh, in the West Caucasus, it's mostly mm, chicken sauce. And they all use cheese and corn paste. Uh, corn paste instead of uh, classic uh, bread. Uh, okay. Whoa, that sounds delicious! Aside from the food, the clothing of Circassian people is very striking. You know, we are speaking of traditional uh, wearings, which used on the holidays mostly. As with other Caucasian groups, the women traditionally wear uh, silk or the dresses, but unlike other ethnic groups in the Caucasus, they will only wear white or reds or blacks and blacks. Mostly reds and whites, because it's uh, some kind of aristocratic style. The patterns of these dresses are handmade with golden embroidery and take a great deal of time to create. Sometimes in six months it needs to, uh, to suit such kind of dress. And those they are mainly worn on national holidays. Circassian menswear was traditionally a military dress. This consisted of trousers, belts, shirts, an ovid jacket when not worn for battle, as well as several ornamental tubes traditionally holding gunpowder. An essential piece of ornament for any Circassian man are weapons. Traditionally, they will have two weapons on them, a dagger and a long sheathless sword called a shashwa. As with women's wear, the colours would normally be restricted to reds, blacks and browns, with the aristocracy exclusively wearing white. Whatever they fancy, green, they are just common people, just Russians, as we all know. There is no so much difference between other Russian people and other modern people. Even, even in villages, even in uh, One of the most notable aspects of Circassian culture is their dancing. The nearest thing I could find is it's a bit like flamenco, but more boisterous. Let's take a look. The Adigia are one of the most vibrant and striking people of the Caucasus, with a fascinating culture and enthralling history. I would like to say a big thank you to Vitaly who's helped me out loads on this video. If you would like to check out his channel, Ethnographia, please check out the link down below. My name is Andrew and thank you for watching. Up next are the Agul. Baka!